Hey guys, it's Ryan. In this video, we're going to continue to talk about oral pathology, and now we're going to move to salivary gland diseases. So we just finished talking about connective tissue tumors, which are part of the submucosa, and now we're going to stick with the submucosa, but this time talk about diseases that impact salivary glands specifically. For this first video, we're going to talk about reactive lesions. So both major and minor salivary glands can be subject to numerous reactive influences, including trauma, infection, metabolic changes, and immunologic dysfunction. So sort of a miscellaneous category for this first video. So mucus extravasation phenomenon is probably the most important one that you need to know. Um, it's a really long word, but it kind of tells you what it's all about. We're talking about mucus, we're talking about that mucus being extravasated or leaking out into tissue, and then that kind of informs what we're going to be talking about right here. So it's caused by trauma to the salivary duct. So when it, uh, mucus seal is probably the most, um, the most prominent, most common form of mucus extravasation phenomenon. Mucus seal just means that it's containing mucus, and it's most common on the lower lip. So this is a picture of a very classic mucus seal, sort of this bluish, um, translucent appearance, um, super common, and it would basically be if you bit your lip um, a little too hard, you could have um, punctured and caused trauma to a salivary duct, and then you get um, blockage, and um, it forms this collection of mucus fluid in um, this layer of tissue. So mucus seal, very common, and when it occurs on the floor of the mouth, it's no longer called a mucus seal, but it's called a ranula, which uh, means frog's belly. I think it's because it has this kind of larger uh, appearance when it occurs at the floor of the mouth. So mucus seal, ranula, both of these are mucus extravasation phenomena. And the treatment would be complete excision. Complete is important because you have to uh, remove the entire affected gland, and this is just a minor salivary gland, or else you have a higher chance of recurrence if you don't take care of the entire thing. So you have to remove the entire accessory salivary gland. Next we have mucus retention cysts, and before I dive into this one, I want to um, clarify that some people use these two terms interchangeably. They use mucus extravasation phenomenon and mucus retention cyst as meaning the same thing. So this can refer to mucus seals and ranula. It, it depends on the person asking the question. I think in terms of a, a board exam standpoint, we'll treat them as kind of similar, but slightly distinct. And the difference um, for this purpose is that histologically, mucus retention cyst is a true cyst, and a cyst by definition is lined by epithelium. So whereas mucus extravasation phenomenon doesn't necessarily have to be surrounded by epithelium, this one does. And this one is specifically caused by blockage of a salivary duct by a sialolith, which is a calcified, um, calcified mass that's blocking a salivary duct. So it's caused by blockage rather than um, trauma, which is causing the phenomenon that we talked about blockage, we are retaining fluid, it's a retention cyst. So again, a little bit confusing. Some people use these two interchangeably, but we'll treat them slightly different in this cyst distinction. Um, and now to add on another layer, these are distinct from and not to be confused with sinus lesions that have very similar names. There's something called a sinus mucosal, um, and there's an antral pseudocyst, uh, also called a sinus retention cyst. So if you see the word sinus in there, or antral, which is referring to the maxillary sinus, those are separate lesions that we're, we're going to talk about very soon. So next we have necrotizing sialometaplasia. This, um, I feel like, comes up a lot in practice questions as well. The most important thing to remember is that it's rapidly expanding in an ulcerative lesion. So you, here you can see this ulcerative appearance, and usually it's due to ischemic necrosis of minor salivary glands in response to trauma 
or local anesthesia, for example, you're giving a greater palatine block. Now this is something that heals on its own in six to 10 weeks and doesn't need um, any other treatment other than palliative treating the symptoms. Okay, so now we have sinus retention cysts. So to separate that from mucus retention cysts, the sinus is only talking about blockage of glands in the sinus mucosa. And here we can't see it clinically, but we can see it radiographically. So we can see this sort of radiopaque dome-shaped lesion along the base, the floor of the sinus here. So that's a sinus retention cyst. And no treatment is typically needed for this. It's pretty uh, benign. Now the sinus mucosal is in some ways similar to this one in that it involves either trauma or blockage of the ostium, which is the opening that drains the maxillary sinus into the nasal cavity. However, a sinus mucosal tends to expand gradually and be more aggressive than this sinus retention cyst. Next we have sarcoidosis, which is hyperimmune, and this means um, it, it involves granulomas. Hyperimmune meaning that the immune system is um, responding, it's over-responding to some stimulus, uh, something we talked about when we talked about mucosal lesions that were immunologic. Sarcoidosis may be triggered by mycobacteria, which is also the um, etiolo etiologic agent for tuberculosis. Uh, primarily, it's a pulmonary disease, but it also affects the salivary glands, which is why we're talking about it in this video, and mucosa. Since it's affecting the salivary glands, it, it results in xerostomia, which is probably the most important component of sarcoidosis, xerostomia being dry mouth, which is often a thing tested on exams because dry mouth has very um, serious side effects for the oral health in terms of um, get, having a higher caries risk. Now, again, I love having these syndromes mapped out as mathematical equations, so we actually have two syndromes this time linking to sarcoidosis. So Lofgren's syndrome involves erythema nodosum, bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, and the hilar lymph nodes are those associated with the lungs, and arthritis. Whereas Herefort syndrome involves anterior uveitis, parotid gland enlargement, facial and nerve palsy, and a fever. And it's also called uveo parotid fever, which is probably the best way to remember this one because it sort of merges together most of the components of the syndrome. It merges together this uveitis, it merges together the parotid gland involvement, and the fever. And you just have to remember the facial nerve palsy on top of all that. So here for uveo parotid fever and Lofgren involving the lymph nodes, L and L, maybe it can help there, and uh, this redness and arthritis. Since it's hyperimmune, we're using corticosteroids, which are an anti-inflammatory that can calm down the overactive immune system. And now we have Sjogren's uh, syndrome, excuse me, and Sjogren's syndrome is probably one of the most tested autoimmune conditions for dental exams because it affects the salivary glands um, very much so. So Sjogren's is autoimmune and it's lymphocyte mediated. It affects the salivary and the tear glands, so it just kind of dries out the entire body, and it has two main forms. The primary Sjogren syndrome involves this keratoconjunctivitis sicca, which is just a fancy word for dry eyes, and xerostomia, which we've already said is dry mouth. Now, secondary involves both dry eyes and dry mouth, that's the same, plus another autoimmune disease, usually rheumatoid arthritis, or RA. Rheumatoid arthritis is another autoimmune condition which often occurs in tandem with um, an autoimmune condition like Sjogren's. And RA can involve the TMJ, so that itself can have some oral 
and facial components. Treatment for this is symptomatic and any patient that has Sjogren's syndrome is going to have a high caries risk due to xerostomia. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please leave a like on this video and subscribe to my channel for more oral pathology and other things dentistry. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.